1962. Life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Thomas Hobbes used these words to describe the state of nature. But in this Europe, a land of one all-powerful government means it just may have the same consequences of having none at all. The New Order, Last Days of Europe, is a Hearts of Iron 4 mod in which the Axis powers, primarily consisting of Germany, Italy, and Japan, were victorious in their military endeavors throughout the world. This mod examines one interpretation of this alternate history. Now set in January 1st, 1962, you may choose any nation in this world, and through the actions of the player, can choose whether to try and crush these evil forces or lead them. Now with the meta context out of the way, we can start and see the world that is formed as a result of this twisted turn of events. The New Order workshop description page reads as follows. The year is 1962 and Europe rests under the jackboot. World War II has been over for 20 years, but its legacy still lives on. The German Reich reigns supreme from the Atlantic Sea to the once great city of Moscow, ruling Europe with an iron fist. Thousands live and die every day under German tyranny, yearning for freedom that may never come. But all is not well in the Reich. Hitler lay on his deathbed, even as the first German Raumzenot lands on the moon. And already the vultures pick at his corpse. Albert Speer, Martin Bormann, Hermann Goering, and Reinhard Heydrich each prepare to take power in the Reich, and the world waits with bated breath for the storm that is surely coming. Outside of the Reichstag in the megacity of Germania, partisans prepare for their final struggle and Heinrich Himmler plots to bring the world to the edge of from his separatist utopia in the Ordenstadt of Burgundy. Across the seas, the United States gathers allies to prevent the fall of democracy in the world, struggling to contain its own politics long enough to tear up the treaties that ended the Second World War. In Asia, the Japanese Empire groans under the weight of rivals within as well as without, as a hundred different cultures struggle and begin to cooperate in the goal of finally overthrowing their slaveholder. In the Mediterranean, an old alliance feuds with itself. A reformer in Italy seeks to create a hotbed of democracy in Europe, as an aging Franco fights to keep control of Iberia. Russia is shattered, and dozens of warlords scramble to pick up the pieces of a broken nation and restore what Bukharin lost. The world teeters on a careful balance. Will it survive to see a new millennia? Or is this the beginning of the end? The year is 1962, and the world sits on the edge of destruction. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why did I read that to you? I mean, you've probably read the mod description at least, if you're playing the mod. But that's sort of what I'm trying to do with this whole thing here. TNO. The New Order, I'll be referring to it as TNO for the rest of the time, is chock full of long stretches of um, dialogue, which is good. It helps with um, world building, but it might not capture your attention if you're just the average player and you just want to fight the wars and uh, unify Russia or um, Goering's Wild Ride or whatever. I want to be here to um, read it to you, basically, so you don't have to... Um, Use all that brain power. I'll do it. And you just listen. Sound good? Yeah, it sounds good. Now, any story involving the Second World War, whether fictional or otherwise, always starts with Nazi Germany and the turbulence on the European continent. For the German war machine, history goes along as usual until the entry of the Italian Empire on June 10, 1940. With the collapse of the French Republic and the troops pouring in, through the Ardennes and all that. Italy can focus the most of its forces in the Mediterranean and in North Africa. Now, the first thing that happens is Germans use paratroopers and get, get Gibraltar. They paratroop into Gibraltar and are able to capture it. And the Italians are able to maneuver swiftly throughout North Africa taking the Suez Canal and leaving the British Navy, now without Gibraltar or the Suez, unable to get reinforcements or refuel, which makes them quick and easy targets for the Italian Navy and Air Force. 
At this point, the German and Italian Axis have successfully defeated Poland, Denmark, Norway, France, annihilated the British Expeditionary Force at Dunkirk, and disabled a large portion of the British Navy in the Mediterranean. However, German ambitions were not yet satisfied, and they turned their attention eastward. Due to a myriad of factors that will be touched upon in other videos, the Soviet Union was led by Nikolai Bukharin, and led with a concentration on the new economic policy, a policy which was first headed up by Vladimir Lenin. This ended up having disastrous results for the Soviet Union, and when the Wehrmacht executed Operation Barbarossa on June 22, 1941, according to Adolf Hitler's real-life prediction, the Soviet Union collapsed quickly and was unable to put up an effective defense. After a campaign of approximately a year and a half, with German forces occupying the vast majority of the population centers west of the Urals, a coup in the Soviet Union was the nail in the coffin that resulted in the complete dissolution of the Soviet Union altogether. For purposes of administration, the Third Reich formed four Reichskommissariats, those being Ostland, Ukraine, Muscovine, and the Caucasus. During the same time, on the other side of the world, the Sino-Japanese War had been raging for some time, and without international support, the Chinese Republic was put at a severe disadvantage, with the Japanese Empire having an uncontested supremacy of the seas. With difficulty, Japan was able to put China in a stalemate and form a solid defense by 1942, so they could turn their attention across the Pacific. But also in 42, a new monster was caught in the crosshairs of the Empire of Japan, that being the United States of America. The leading military officials of the Japanese Imperial Navy were much divided on the prospect of attacking America, but the aggressive viewpoint won out, and the Imperial Navy sunk the USS Enterprise and proceeded to annihilate the U.S. Pacific Fleet and the stores of fuel that were housed there. Following that, the Imperial Navy engaged in a massive Pacific offensive with little to no Allied interference, taking Midway Island, the Philippines, Burma, Malaya, Indonesia, Singapore, and several strategic islands throughout the Pacific. This, however, did not put the United States out of the war. It soon became clear that the United States could produce ships and send them into battle much faster than the Japanese Navy could afford to. By 1943, the United States had adopted the strategy of island hopping. This put the Japanese at a severe disadvantage. This went until 1945, when the United States Navy invaded Iwo Jima. The United States Marines found little resistance at first, but once their troops had disembarked, the Japanese forces emerged from the island and from the sea to contest the American invasion. The Japanese kept the U.S. Navy in check for 87 days. This caused the United States military to overcommit in order to try to win the battle. This battle resulted in the largest naval battle in the history of the world, resulting in the destruction of the U.S. fleet, condemning the Marines on the island. Though victorious, the Japanese Imperial Navy was in shambles with no hope of replacing their losses in a meaningful time period. As a result of this, the Japanese decided to take drastic measures. At 8.39 a.m. on July 4, 1945, every clock on Pearl Harbor ceased to tick as an atomic bomb obliterated the populace of the area and many, many more would be affected by the radiation. The rebutting base at Pearl Harbor and the Navy ships docked inside of it were destroyed. The morale of the American people was at an all-time low, and they ended their war with the Empire of Japan in defeat. With all other opponents out of the picture, the Japanese military could afford to turn their attention back to their massive front in China, and arguably, the last bastion of democracy. By 1945, the J Chinese forces were forced to deal with famine, lack of supplies, and a massive, rejuvenated Japanese offensive. The Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, still, however, turned down the peace offerings that the Japanese issued him. The Japanese fought their way to Zhongxing with massive brutality and devastation in their wake. Upon the smoldering ashes of a once proud Badai fortress, the Japanese proclaimed overall peace in Asia and the rest of the world. Back in the European theater, the calming in Europe allowed Germany to finish off the last possible rival to their power the United Kingdom. Germany had launched Operation Sea Lion, the largest amphibious invasion in world history to that point. With a mass of German troops on the Isle, 
the different sections of the United Kingdom balkanized in order to minimize damage to themselves. Scotland and Wales broke away with a separate peace with Germany. England was made a puppet state, and Cornwall was placed under German supervision to have an even firmer grip on the Isle. Back on the continent, France was placed under a sympathetic government, and Brittany was made a nation once again. Down in Africa, fascist Spain was given French territory on the Algerian coast and in Morocco. By the end of all conflict, the Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan dissolved their faction and relegated themselves to their own now massive spheres of influence. From here on out, we're going to go country by country concerning their post-World War II history and the major players within this big game. Those being the United States, Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and the Kingdom of Italy. Starting with the United States, after their defeat in the Second World War, the people were extremely divided, and after the election of 1948, out of the five candidates on the ballot, no candidate was able to claim a majority. As a result of this, the decision was sent to the House of Representatives, where Thomas Dewey was voted in as the President of the United States. Now, the Democratic Party, who possessed the presidency at the end of the Second World War, was completely shunned by the populace of America. Facing irrelevancy, the Democratic Party approached the Republican Party with a request to merge into one. After a very narrow vote, the decision was accepted, and they now became two factions within the same party, now known as the Republican Democratic Party. Other factions forming after the war were the National Progressive Front, headed by Henry A. Wallace and Glenn Taylor in 1947. In 1951, George S. Patton forms the Patriotic Party. Both formed successful parties in the election of 1952, but the clear majority lay with Dwight D. Eisenhower, a Republican Democrat and war hero who made his name a legend for his defense of the British Isles in the last days of the war in Europe. By the next election in 1958, Dwight D. Eisenhower claimed an even larger victory that prompted the National Progressive Front and the Patriotic Party to do the same act that the Democrats did nearly a decade before merging themselves into one party and restoring the United States to a two-party binary. In the 1960 election, the National Progressive Party put up Strom Thurmond and Claude Pepper, though as the election drew near, Eisenhower committed to a patriotic power play by ripping up the Akagi Accords, the treaty that recognized Japanese hegemony in the Pacific and allowed Japanese troops to be stationed at strategic ports within the United States. This was met with massive support from the people, and the Republican Democratic candidates Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy, as his vice president, were elected. By 1962, tension was nearly at a boiling point with the Hawaiian Missile Crisis. Though diffused and tensions relaxed, Kennedy was praised for his actions to dim the mutual anger, while Nixon was harshly criticized for his lack of action. Moving on to Germany, now known as the Gross Germanisches Reich. Following its victory in the Second World War, Germany was able to pursue its goals completely uninhibited. Its two most famous projects were the transforming of Berlin into Hitler's and Albert Speer's pure imagination, redubbing the city Germania. Secondly, the Atlantropa project, which sought to place a dam across the Dardanelles, a dam at the mouth of the Mediterranean at Gibraltar, and a third dam connecting Sicily to Tunisia. This would have unimaginably negative consequences. First of this was a sea level drop by roughly 200 meters, or roughly 660 feet. Secondly, an intention of this project was to make more land for population and job expansion. However, the land gained by the project were nothing but useless salt flats, and could not be lived in at all. This caused a diplomatic catastrophe in which the Italian Empire severed all diplomatic connection with Germany. The Italians would found their own faction, known as the Triumvirate. As the world began to cool down after World War II, Germany found itself thrown into another crisis. In 1950, the German economy collapsed and various factions formed within Germany in order to solve this problem. Albert Speer was a reformist who wanted to liberalize the Reich. Himmler, on the other hand, believed that National Socialism did not go far enough, and founded the Burgundian system. Hermann Goering looked to the past and saw the solution in a return to German global conquest. Finally, Martin Bormann took a very conservative approach, 
of minimalist reforms. This boiled over for the first time in the 1950s when Heinrich Himmler sought to take advantage of a reorganizing Western Russia hurling itself against the Reichskommissariat Moscowine. He planned to assault the defending Wehrmacht from the rear, destroying them before marching on Berlin and ousting Adolf Hitler. Their plan was only foiled by Hans Speidel and other generals who preempted their attack, killing many and sending others fleeing into the Russian frontier. In order to prevent the dissolution of the whole German sphere, Hitler offered Himmler a deal. He offered him his own state in the Reichskommissariat Belgien Nord Frankenreich, as well as a large portion of the French state. Himmler accepted this deal, though a large portion of the SS stayed in Germany under the command of Reinhard Heydrich, though tensions remained very high between the SS and the Wehrmacht. Just as Germany seemed to exhale at the end of this conflict, the Hungarian government collapsed from the crisis, and Germany negotiated with Slovakia and Romania to let the two invade Hungary in exchange for economic assistance. With the conflict in Western Russia coming to an end, and a large necessity for cheap labor, the Germans transitioned from a system of extermination with prisoners to one of systematized slavery. With free labor so rampant, the German economy soon began to rely upon it, and with so many jobs taken by unpaid labor, the young people in Germany began to seek outside global influences in compensation for opportunities denied to them domestically. This caused a great disillusionment for Germany in the hearts of the German youth. Though the economy is recovering under the scaffold of slave labor, the free people still remain unsatisfied. Now for the Italian Empire. After the conclusion of the Second World War, the Italian Empire was left supremely disadvantaged by the Atlantropa project. Italian sea trade was almost completely rendered useless. Prominent port cities such as Venice, Naples, and Genoa were landlocked, and the Adriatic Sea ceased to exist. Taking these former naval facilities and moving them back to the coast enraged the Italian Empire and their tributaries. Mussolini was so furious as the head of the state that he, served, he severed his alliances with Germany and repealed the race laws of 1938. Mussolini went as far as to welcome tens of thousands of Jews into the Levantine territory. It is rumored that Mussolini, as his own death neared, helped set the groundwork for a revival of Polish nationalism. Italy's breaking away with Germany resulted in unexpected benefits for the new triumvirate. Trade between Japan and Italy kicked off especially in the trade of petroleum. The United States also opened up lines of economic trade and communication with the Empire of Italy. Mussolini died on June of 1953, naming his son-in-law, Galeazzo Chiano, the successor as Il Duce of Italy. Lastly, the Empire of Japan. Japan, now the pan-Pacific power of the world, was now put in immediate rivalry with Germany following the breakdown of the Axis. The United States, still bitter over their defeat in the Second World War and after Eisenhower ripped up the Akagi Accords and the following Hawaiian Missile Crisis, has only made post-war tensions worse and worse. The politics of Japan is dominated by the Yokusinkai, with multiple factions that make up its ideologies within the party. This same party's disunity was deemed detrimental to the nation's war effort during World War II, and many of their aggregating politicians disappeared after meetings with army officials. This effort did not yield positive results as corruption scandals continued to deteriorate the reliability of the all-encompassing party. This unreliability resulted in many new politicians emerging as independents and getting seats in the parliament. In the economic sector of the Japanese empire, it was controlled by an oligarchy of semi-feudal conglomerates that endeavored to maximize their reach and control. This near monopolization of the Japanese economy was kept very close to the government and monarchy of Japan and attempts to control all of Japan's civilian and military industry. These guys were known as the Zaibutsus. This economic system is kept alive by importing raw materials from its subjects around the Pacific for rates that are almost unprofitable for the host countries. Furthermore, these Japanese tributary nations are forbidden from creating their own industrial complexes. This is a system of enforced pan-Pacific imperialism. 
As a result of this, there are many instances of sabotage among these juggernaut conglomerates. The main rival to these long-standing titans is the Kieretsus, making their own way in the world, much to the disapproval of the Zaibutsus. These turmoils have led to a near boiling point as the two giants seek to battle for economic supremacy. Alright, and that's really all I had for this video, but I plan on doing more more in-depth countries or like we'll do entire like alliance sort of in-depth systems. I'll look over um, pretty much the entirety of Russia, point out all sort of significant peoples and I intend to make it a sort of big thing if uh, TNO catches on I'll do Kaiser Reich, a thousand week Reich, uh, Red Flood, whatever, whatever's, whatever's going on. So I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe and like and all that and I'll be back again real soon.